Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. What do you think? Is breakfast really the most important meal of the day? Or is it the most dangerous meal of the day? Joining us on the show today for the fourth time is a man who routinely skips breakfast and often skips lunch too. Mr. Mark Sisson is a rebel who takes great satisfaction in beating the tar out of conventional wisdom. He's one of the veterans, of course, of the paleo, primal, and ancestral health movement, and I very much doubt that we'd be where we are today without his intelligence, dedication, and passion for helping others improve their lives. Back in the day, we've had many touch points over the years. Mark and I have even played music at some of his uh, conferences and things like that. He's been very supportive of some of our artistic projects over the years, and uh, I consider him a modern-day renaissance man and, and certainly uh, someone who is a hero to many of us in the sense that he definitely doesn't act his age, and I mean that in a good way. Mark is someone who refuses to let his numerical age dictate how he lives his life, especially when you look around at, at how most of us are these days. It's good to be the weird one. And on today's show, we're chatting about how metabolic flexibility is like a Swiss army knife. <laughs> we're talking about bacon as a gateway drug to real food, what dirty keto is is and how to avoid it, getting off the hunger treadmill and becoming a fat burning machine, the real deal on all of those vegan propaganda documentaries that have come out recently, and tons more. But before we get there, here's a note that just came in from Blake. He says, hi, Abel. We are very rural and there isn't much in our area for health and wellness except one little anytime fitness. Your show and your book are a constant spice of motivation. Anytime I'm feeling weak or get the efforts, I just read a bit of The Wild Diet or listen to a couple of episodes of the show. We are now just about a year in with zero sugar, zero grains, occasional wild rice that we harvest ourselves. We have nearly eliminated alcohol, and I am down 40 pounds. Thank you for being out in the public and available to us. Also, I would love to hear you interview Kenton Whitman of Rewild University. You can find him through YouTube, their website, or the Unleash Your Life podcast. He is an expert on mindfulness and natural movement. Thank you, Blake from Wisconsin. Blake! Thank you so much for writing in. This oh, So many things about this when I first read it made me smile. Let me just quickly cover a few things that you said here. Uh, zero sugar, zero grains. I was just talking to Vinny Tortorich, who of course leads the No Sugar, No Grains movement, has been for years. And uh, so we have some shows coming out. For a lot of you who are listening out there or watching, that's an easy win right there. If you can ditch sugar or turn it down as much as possible, and he added sugars and all that nonsense, and then kick out the grains as well, then you're going to get a lot of results really quickly just by doing those two very simple things. But, Blake, I love that you had the occasional wild rice that you harvest yourselves because that is one of the greatest examples of one of the wild edibles that's still around if, if you're in the right area for it. And we love wild rice. It's such a treat. It's such a different kind of, of food, really filling, um, especially when you compare it to the, the type of rice that most people are used to eating. Uh, and then you you said that you nearly eliminated alcohol and you've dropped 40 pounds. So if there's another quick win, kicking out alcohol, if you're looking to uh, lean down and and really restore your health, then kicking out alcohol is another really easy win. So Good on you, Blake. And of course, the 40 pounds came off, so your health is, is going to be better because of that. You're doing it. I love it. Um, thank you for that. And also, kudos to you. It's it's easier said than done. Kicking out alcohol or, or turning it down in your life can be very difficult, especially for, for some people. So anyone who's able to do that, um, that's, that's an extra skill because a lot of us are reliant on substances and we might not even know it. So anytime you can pump the brakes on pretty much anything you're consuming habitually in your life, it'll do you a favor and give you a little bit of perspective. So well done, Blake. Now, how about you, dear listener? If you enjoyed The Wild Diet or you transformed your life in some way or watched me on TV show <laughs> racing in a bacon suit, I would love to hear your opinion on life, any questions you have or, or anything else. So shoot me an email at abel at fatburningman.com or go to fatburningman.com, sign up for the newsletter, respond to my emails, and I'll respond to you when I can. I love reading um, your perspective on things. It's a very confusing world out there. I'm not always clear on exactly what you need help with. So every time you write in and get in touch with me and let me know 
uh, where you're struggling. It really helps me know who to have on this show next. And, and also, thanks once again for the recommendation. I'll definitely look into that. If you have someone you'd like to recommend that I interview on this podcast, please just drop me a line. Now, if you would like to support this show, um, it's, it's getting challenging out there, but we have a lot of different projects where we're trying to give a lot of value to you uh, in exchange for supporting the show. So for example, these days, most people don't get enough nutrients from their food alone. So my wife, Allison, and I started Wild Superfoods to make it easy for you to load up on the critical nutrients that your body needs. And right now you can grab all four supplements in our ultimate daily bundle, including Future Greens, Mega Omegas, Vitamin D Stack, and Probiotic Spheres. And you can save over a hundred bucks when you sign up for the subscribe and save. Also, when you sign up for the subscribe and save, every dollar helps support this show and uh, we also give you free access to our Fat Burning Tribe coaching community as part of your subscription. So that's a cool thing that we're able to do now. And we're uh, getting a lot of new folks in there. And we really appreciate your support. So go to wildsuperfoods.com and uh, check out all the goodies that we have there. And also, you may have heard me mention in a recent episode of The Fat Burning Man that uh, my new book with a silly title, Designer Baby Still Get Scabies, is out and ready for you. It's a book of mostly silly poetry and ridiculous rhymes, but also it must be said, in the age of shadow banning and censorship, there are a lot of little messages that I baked in there. And uh, it seems like some of you are getting the jokes. There are certain things that I can't really, I'm not supposed to talk about, certain words I'm not supposed to use. Uh, and, uh, you know, the censorship is a real thing. So if you like the real deal and if you'd like some of the inside jokes, then be sure to check out my book, Designer Babies Still Get Scabies. It's now an international bestseller in seven countries. And uh, you can get the audiobook for free when you grab the paperback version uh, for a limited time. So just go to designerbabiesbook.com. This book probably wouldn't have been allowed by most publishers, so we did it all ourselves. Once again, it's at designerbabiesbook.com. That's another way that you can support this show, especially if you're international. Uh, Wild Superfoods, we can't ship internationally quite yet, so if you'd like to buy that book, then it really helps. And also, leave a review. Let me know what you think. Even if you hate it, I, I like hearing your opinions too, but even better, write me a poem back with your opinion. And before we get started with the show, I just want to say we have a lot of giveaways, massive giveaways and fun that we have planned this spring and summer coming up. So make sure that you're signed up for the newsletter over at fatburningman.com. All right, on to the show with Mark Sisson. We're chatting about why metabolic flexibility is like a Swiss army knife, how to use bacon as a gateway drug into eating real food, dirty keto, and what to look out for, how to get off the hunger treadmill and become a fat burning machine, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Mark. All right, folks, returning to the show is Mark Sisson, New York Times bestselling health author, blogger, and entrepreneur. He's the creator, of course, of Mark's Daily Apple, Primal Blueprint, Primal Kitchen, and you may even recognize him from the label of your delicious jar of mayo. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here, Abel. Abel James, the fat, the fat, the fat burning man. You still burning fat, man? Still, I'm burning fat right <laughs> now, my friend. Okay, good. That's that's right. the main thing. I learned from the best. Yeah. It's so cool. Um, it's it's been a while. A lot of stuff has happened. There are a lot of new words and terms. A lot of uh, fads and communities and all that have come and gone, but many things have stayed the same. And uh, you and Brad especially are still crushing it, um, not acting your age in a good way. Maybe you can just start right there. Why are you guys still crushing it? Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, this, is, this has been my passion from the last 30 years is to change the way the world eats. And it started with um, making, you know, doing some books on training and, and racing and performance nutrition and sort of evolved into Mark's daily apple, this blog. And then, and then I started writing books about the subject matter. And, uh, as I wrote more and more about this lifestyle that we call the primal blueprint, so much of it was came down to, um, teaching your body how to burn fat and how to extract energy from, from fat as opposed to being dependent on carbohydrate. So the, uh, the passion has been now to, uh, to teach the world about metabolic flexibility, because that's really, after all these different iterations of paleo primal, ancestral, uh, low carb, 
keto, dirty keto, <laughs> Atkins, whatever. Yeah. Um, it turns out that really what we're all after is metabolic flexibility. And however we get there, uh, once you become metabolically flexible, you have the world at your fingertips. You have the world of energy and muscle mass and, 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 and strong cognition. And all these things are there at your disposal uh, because you've trained your body to tap into this genetic potential that we're all born with, but we all happen to lose over uh, the first part of our lives as we get, uh, you know, shunted down that path of carbs and sugar and sweet and all this other stuff. So, so yeah, so that's, that's part of what keeps us going is, is this message that's so exciting that I want to like scream it to everyone in the world, like metabolic flexibility, pal, that's, that's yeah. where it's at, you know, and you got to, you got to get there. Once you get there, it's empowering in so many areas of your life. And I love that you're referring to it as metabolic flexibility, because like calling something you're in the state of ketosis or that's keto or that's that's paleo. It's so obtuse and squishy, whereas metabolic flexibility, at least when I hear you guys talking about it, I'm thinking, oh, this is a skill. This is like a survival mechanism that we all used to have that most people have just, you know, it's atrophied or never actually developed. Yeah, it's a Swiss army knife that your body has to, to use different tools to extract energy from different substrates, whether it's the fat on your plate of food or the fat stored in your uh, belly and thighs and hips, whether it's the carbohydrate on your plate of food, the glucose in your bloodstream, the glycogen in your muscles, whether it's the amino acids, whether it's ketones that your liver is making when you're short on carbohydrates to feed the brain. All these things, you know, as they come together, make this beautiful symphony of uh, energy substrates that we can all draw upon regardless of when we're eating or how much we're eating or how often we're eating. And again, that's the part of it that is so freeing. If you can go about your day and have all the energy you want and have you know the strength that you want and the muscle mass and not get sick uh, and most importantly not get hungry, then you are metabolically flexible and, and you, it, just, it just like frees up so much time to do a lot of other things. Yeah, and I've heard you refer to intermittent eating, which I like the term much better than intermittent fasting, just because it makes more sense. You know, like you're not really accounting for it, at least when it, when I'm fasting, I'm not accounting for it as, as time not eating. It's just it feels like a default mode that I'm in until I start eating, and then I'm in eating mode. And uh, and for a lot of people, they can get a whole lot of benefit if they just start there. They start squishing their eating time into. For you, I think it's what one to seven. PM? So Typically it's one to 7 PM. Although, um, you know, more recently it's many days. I just don't eat lunch. I'm, I'm, uh, I find that if I eat what I used to consider a regular lunch, it's just too much food. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll just go till dinner time and eat. And, and again, I, you know, any listener who hasn't delved into this, um, don't get scared off. This is, this is by choice. This is, this is me just not being hungry. And I'm not consciously thinking, Oh, if I can just make it till dinner time, everything is going to be okay. It's me going, oh, geez, I, you know, uh, I had a great paddle, and now I've got to do some work, and I've got a meeting that I got to get to, and I don't have time for lunch. Oh well, no, no problem. Um, and it's again, it all comes down to harnessing hunger, appetite, and cravings. If you can get a, get control of that, which otherwise historically has been in control of you your whole life, you know, it's hunger that controls most people's lives, like. When is breakfast? And then when is the mid-morning snack? And when is lunch? And oh my God, we just had lunch. It was great. It was a great lunch. What's for dinner? Uh, you know, or I can't make that meeting because it's lunchtime and I just, well, otherwise I won't be able to eat and I'll go hangry. All these things uh, dissipate when we get rid of hunger, appetite, and cravings. And we just come down to this thing where we just enjoy every bite of food we eat for what it is. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy every bite of food I put in my mouth, but we're not tied to this regular you know, eating strategy. I mean, I was just hanging out with, uh, oh, I know, I know, my, my new massage therapist uh, the other day, bless her heart. Uh, she's, you know, she's, she doesn't know what I do. And she's, you know, it was her first, first time working on me. So she's telling me all about, you know, her strategy of achieving good health and how she does <laughs> detoxes and how she uses herbs and how she eats five small meals a day. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> and I just zip it, Mark. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, so that's, but that's what a lot of people still think they need to have, you know, these small meals that are too evenly spread throughout the day, because that's what keeps your energy levels up. And that's what dissipates hunger. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. 
And there's so much power that comes from not eating somehow. And it builds over time. Don't you think it's, it's, uh, it's bizarre and novel at first when you experience a lot of people haven't felt true hunger. It's a sensation that you have to get used to. The first time I had beer, I spit it out. It was gross. Mine <laughs> right. do, you know, it, but and now, and now, and now it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, right. Now I tell, I told people for a long time, if I had to pick two foods that I could live on for the rest of my life, it would be peanuts and beer. There now, you go. I don't, I don't, I don't do peanuts cause they're bad. They're horrible for me. And same for beer, although I have a little bit of beer, but, but you know, my, like if I, that was my go-to people would think, well, you know, cherry Garcia ice cream, maybe, or, you know, <laughs> Cinnabon. No. Beer and peanuts would be, my so go-to, would be my go-to foods, but um, we digress. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, that's, the, that's the, the sort of what we've been focusing on. And, uh, you know, he and I both are denying our, our age. So, you know, Brad, he probably told you earlier, you know, he just went out to a track meet the other day and got in a track meet and ran a 400-meter run, you know, <laughs> and then did the high jump. Um, and... Uh, you know, and he did pretty well. He didn't do anywhere near what he would have done, but he's in his, you know, fit at 50s. So you got to hand that to him. And I just had a conversation with my best friend, like literally an hour ago. And I said to him, I came back from my ultimate Frisbee game on Sunday night, and I was pretty beat up. There were 35 guys that showed up. And so we had like four teams that were, you know, uh, on and off the field. And it was a very fast paced game. And I had a blast. But I came home and I go, and I thought to myself, all right, I'm going to be 67 in July. Like, really, when does this end? When yeah. is it no longer appropriate for me <laughs> to be doing this? But for right now, I'm having a blast. So I'll keep, I'll, I'll keep doing it, right? So uh, part of that whole thing is to, is to, is to keep playing, um, to keep hanging out with, with younger people and people who are, you know, very energetic you know, it's, it's, a, it's become a bit of a cliche, but it's, but it's so true. You know, you're, you're the average of the five people you hang out with. Uh, so I try to hang out with really good looking young people who have a lot of money. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, try to, I try to surround myself with, with, you know, energetic people. Yeah. And, and, you know, spending a lot of time with the primal team today, talking to Brad this morning for a couple hours, you guys are, are, defying the status quo in such ridiculous ways that people would, I'm sure they have trouble believing that you are the ages that you are. But I think it's more than that because you mentioned it too. It's more about the energy, right? Yeah. Like talking to Brad, it's like, it feels like he's in his thirties too. And we, like he could hang on a run with me. I don't know if yeah. I can hang with him. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah. And can you hang with him for seven minutes in 34 degree water? And right. I, you know, and I, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, tomorrow I've got a nice, I got a paddle um, on the, um, I'm in Miami Beach and so I'm going to be in the Bay uh, paddling for an hour and a half with my buddy Elliot Bisno. I don't know if you know Elliot, but yeah. um, Summit Group. And uh, so we're going to, you know, I'm just, I can't wait to do that. That's like, right. Not a workout. It's just fun. And uh, oh, by the way, we are getting a workout, but who cares? We're just having a blast, uh, you know, chatting it up on the ocean there. Um, and I've got, uh, yesterday I, I did, uh, I have a fat bike you know, four and a half inch wide tires. I just ride on the sand so I can go 10 miles up the beach from my house and get the, the most amazing workout without climbing hills, without, um, you know, the fear of going too fast downhill and crashing. Yeah. The worst that, on a fat bike in deep sand, the worst that happens is you're going like two miles an hour and you fall over and you get, <laughs> and you get sand on all of your sweaty, sweaty body and, and you just hope nobody saw you do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you just got to keep it fun like that. But yeah. also one thing that I read in your book, um, and I've wondered about this, is how do you manage getting enough sun, but not too much to the point where you could be yeah. developing skin conditions later, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm look, I'm in Miami Beach, and but it's winter now. So, like, I just I was in the sun for two hours today, um, first time in a long time. And, uh, you know, the UV index was like four and down to two and a half or one and a half by the time I left the beach. I was there from like, 30 to 4 30. And uh, so that was that was good sun. I literally am not have not been getting enough sun per my prescription for a while. I've been traveling back and forth to California and uh, and um, I was in Hawaii for a week. And even then, you know, I, I'm I'm careful not to get too much sun, but um, I'm also I'm also getting those sorts of issues uh, that that the dermatologist wants to burn off. Um, at my age, because of the, 
the, the enormous amount of time I spent in the sun in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. I literally, yeah. I was a contractor. I worked outside uh, in, all through the summer with my shirt off. Uh, I would go home and run 20 miles with my shirt off. I mean, I, would, I spent my, you know, my whole life pretty much um, close to naked in the sun. And, uh, you know, that did add up over time. Uh, I've been very careful in the last 20 years about putting sunscreen on my face and make being careful not to burn. And I'm very aware of where the burn, uh, that little zone is. And I, I come in and if I have to stay outside, I just put on clothing and keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And that's really what it is, right? You just want to avoid getting burned. For me, it's always the schnoz that gets me, especially yeah. on my runs. Yeah. <laughs> Sweat off that zinc and oh God. But anyway, a good hat and you've got it covered. But it is something that's definitely worth paying attention to. It's, it's worth saying too, we're up at 8,000 feet here look at, in Colorado, looking at a bunch of 14,000 foot mountains. And uh, if you're up at elevation, don't let the sun get ahead of you. That's I, I more than ever now. Do, especially in the cold, the especially in the wintertime. You know, I, yeah. I spend time in Aspen. And uh, even in the fall when it's nice and crisp and you're, you know, you, you, so it's, it's crisp at night, but it's warm enough in the day that you can hike without a shirt and you go up, you know, to 11 or 12,000 feet. And, and it feels like nothing's happening. And all of a sudden you get back and you've been lobsterized. Yeah. So yeah. Good to, good to pay attention to that. Having said that, I mean, I think everybody needs to get sun. Vitamin D is the most important, you know, vitamin. And uh, I supplement with it a lot throughout the year if I'm not getting regular doses of sun. Yeah. Yeah, I do as well. And uh, it's one of those things that especially just a little bit of sun, I think five or 10 minutes today, that's enough, you know, and, and it makes a big difference in between shows when I'm recording all day, go outside, just a little bit of sun. It only takes a few seconds for you. You can feel something happening and, and it's yes. powerful yep. stuff. Yeah. But once again, you don't want to abuse it. Okay. Let's, I want to hear you rant a little bit if you don't mind, Mark. Because okay. Yeah. Dirty keto, all of these yeah. products that I would never eat, you know, like all that you would never eat being called the same thing oftentimes is what we we do, whether it's paleo, keto, and I'm sure they're going to be carnivore products with pan, yeah. plants in them and sugars in them. They're going to figure out a way. So let's hear you rant about what's going on and how we can. Well, I mean, it. it's, it's a little bit disappointing that, um, you know, people are trying to hack their way into eating their comfort foods uh, and then creating these bizarre concoctions that they're calling keto. And they call them keto because they're high in fat and they don't have any actual real sugar, but they might have xylitol you know, or, or mannitol, a lot of, it. Uh, you know, and, and, um, erythritol and, you know, the sugar alcohols, or they might have, um, you know, uh, stevia or monk food or something like that. And, um, uh, not so great choices of, of fats in many cases, uh, and, you know, added ingredients that you would otherwise never consider eating if it was a regular middle of the aisle uh, in the middle of the grocery store thing that you picked up and you say, Oh, that's processed. I'm not going to eat that. But if it's processed in keto, Ooh, it's, you right. know, and it says keto, it must be good. So I have a real, I do have a real problem with that. And, and I, for the longest time, um, you know, and I have friends who are in the food business and, and I love them and, you know, they're, they're trying to appeal to an audience that's, I guess, demanding these kinds of products, but I'm not a dessert person. So when people yeah. make me, you know, primal and paleo and keto desserts, I'm like, uh, you know, that's sort of defeating the purpose. It's almost like, you know, in the old days, uh, people said, well, you know, regular soda, Coca-Cola and orange crush, and all, these are bad for you because all the, all the sugar. And, the, and those companies said, okay, we'll give you the same experience without the sugar. So they made diet sodas and they mm -hmm. wound up being probably worse yeah. in some regards. So, you know, um, the answer is always simple, Abel. It's always come back to real food. Just if it's real food, you know, if it's meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit, maybe some starchy tubers once in a while. And if you prepare it, either how you, how you cook it or the herbs and spices that you use, you can mix it up and you can match it up and you can make it very tasty and very palatable. But, um, you know, lo looking for a way to, uh, the, the problem with the whole hacking community, this biohacking community, I think is dangerous because they're looking for shortcuts. They want, right. they want, they don't want to do the work, you know, like give me the benefit of a 50 minute workout in six minutes where you wrap my thighs in ice and I ride a bike real hard, you know, or, you know, give me the benefits of sleep 
by putting on a 3D headset and, and, and playing funky music and, and, and throwing some some spiralized uh, hypnotic at me. I'm not buying it, you know? Yeah. And the same goes for the food. It's like, eat real food. It's pretty damn simple. You know, yeah. get sleep in a real room with with a cool bed and a, in a you know, a blacked out room. Um, you know, go outside and get some sun, eat real food. Um, you know, it's like people just, I think, I mean, some people embrace that. You and I have for sure. But but some people are like, no, uh, I want a shortcut. I want to, I don't want to earn my way into this. I want to buy my way into this. Yeah. By consuming more fat to lose more fat, right? Which which is a well, concept so you is love, so, as this, I understand. It's, it's so bizarre because, you know, the whole keto, the popularized keto move, movement started in that kind of regard, which is, uh, oh boy, we can eat all the bacon we want. You know, that was the original keto thing. And yep. I can eat 4,000 calories a day and not gain weight. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe so, but if you eat 4,000 calories a day, you're not going to lose weight. You're not going to burn off your stored body sure. fat. You're going you're gonna, to, you know, upregulate some systems in your body that are going to cause thermogenesis that you don't want that are probably going to, in the long haul, be deleterious to longevity because you're, you're revving the engine too hard as your body tries to desperately to get rid of those 4,000 calories that it can't store because, you know, you shut off the insulin access pathway. So uh, that was the original kind of, but that was the entry level for uh, this kind of gateway drug for, was for a lot of people was bacon. You know, I can have all the bacon I want and I can have all the fat I want and I can eat whatever I want. I never go hungry as long as I don't eat uh, uh, sugar and, and grains. And I can put a pad of butter on my uh, beef burger you know, without the bun, <laughs> yeah. and it's, I can, people are looking for ways to add fat to an otherwise fatty meal. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, I think we've uh, thankfully gotten away from that now, but, um, but it was, it was kind of crazy at first. Yeah. Well, because one thing that it seemed like was getting lost was the nose to tail approach, the eating real food approach. Yes. And then here comes carnivore with that, which is great. I, I love that that's built in, but the idea that you can never have a plant, yeah. not that that's the way that people are doing it exactly. It's either you're never having a plant or you're using words wrong. <laughs> I kind of think yeah, I object yeah. to both of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, um, Sean Baker and, and Paul Saladino you know, are good friends of mine. Yeah. And I really, I, applaud, I'm having them on as well. I, I applaud what they're doing, I applaud the, their their passion for what they're doing. Um, I completely understand, especially in Saladino's case, I understand his objection with um, plants, and I think it's a very novel approach to think that plants are basically emergency food, and as long as you eat nose to tail, you get everything you need from the animal, uh, and that as emergency foods, plants, you know, they have these things that we used to call antioxidants, and some of us still do, uh, antioxidants, you know, phytochemicals, uh, polyphenols, uh, which, which so many nutritionists would say they're beneficial and they're necessary. And Paul would say, not only are they not necessary, they might be harmful. And that's a really interesting approach. So what'll be, I think, uh, telling in the next couple of years is to, is to see somebody who's been on a true carnivore program for years. Uh, and look at their their health and their markers, right? Yeah. Um, but until then, like I feel like I've I definitely cut back on my vegetable intake. So don't tell anybody, but I don't eat a big ass salad anymore. Really? On a regular basis, I'll have a salad once in a while, but I look at it differently now. I look at it as um, it's going to fill me up with some non nutrient dense stuff that I really don't need, and I think. You know, one of the things that Paul and I think Sean, but but more specifically Paul, talk about uh, would be this the the fiber conversation, right? Yeah. Like you got to have fiber or else you don't poop right. Well, everybody I know that's been on carnivore poops like a pro. Yeah, and, and my dog does too. Yeah, and it's not it's not an issue of not enough fiber. It turns out, and I've thought this for twenty years, fecal matter poop is supposed to be bacterial turnover. It's not supposed to be bits and pieces of straw 
that you ate to scour your intestines and because you couldn't digest them, you know, you them out. Uh, it's supposed to be bacterial terminal. You have 100 trillion bacteria in your, in your gut. They have a very short life, sometimes days, sometimes hours. Uh, and they turn over at a fairly rapid rate. And that's a good thing. So as long as your bacterial turnover is good, you're going to be having regular movements to, re to, to get rid of those. And it does not require uh, fiber in the amounts that they're talking about. The other thing, which I, th I find really compelling, is the notion that, um, that plant matter acts as a substrate for some of these bacteria to create short-chain fatty acids with which to feed the lining of the gut. Now, that's an interesting and a very, uh, again, another compelling statement. But uh, recently, Paul has uh, done some research. And I, and I again, I approve of the research. And it it's explains a lot of what's been going on with me. Um, it turns out that, that uh, collagen peptides can act as a substrate for these short-chain fatty acids. And so if you, eat, if you eat nose to tail and you're getting collagen as part of your, your, your um, diet, and by the way, if you think back to 100 years ago, 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago, people ate gristle. Like you ate gristle and you swallowed it, right? And it might have made its way down to you know, the back end of the small intestine and the first part of the colon, and it might have been it might have acted as a substrate for uh, for those bacteria. So he's got some great arguments, and I and I'm starting to think that there's something there. Yeah. Uh, and 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 then having said that, as I say, I cut back on my uh, vegetable intake, but I haven't eliminated it because I do like the occasional you know uh, broccoli. Today I had like what I think is my ideal lunch. I had a skirt steak with some uh, broiled um, spinach or sauteed spinach yeah. and um, fabulous. And it was all I needed. And it was, you know, probably 570 calories total. And um, I'll have dinner tonight. And those are the two meals I'll eat all day. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing that you realize when you, when you get really metabolically flexible is that you also get metabolically efficient mm -hmm. and the efficiency starts to, if you do the math, you think, well, why do I need that many calories in a day anyway? How is it that if I do the math in a textbook from 20 years ago, it says I need 2,500 calories a day to sustain my 170 pounds um, and 3,500 calories a day if I'm working out an hour and 20 minutes a day. You know, if you do the math and you realize that protein at four calories per gram, nobody needs more than 120 grams of protein in a day, nobody. So if you get 80, that's 320 grams. But if you're doing this right, um, those of those 320 uh, calories, 320 mm -hmm. calories in 80 grams, the first 30 grams don't even have, they're not combusted, they're not supposed to be combusted. So why would you even assign them a caloric value, right? They're not even being combusted. So they're being used to, to rebuild, repair, renew, regenerate, uh, and and enter that that cycle of, of of building in the body, and then if you are low on carbs, and you cut your carbs down, and you're convincing your body that you need to burn fat, your body starts burning fat, and it starts creating ketones. And I don't know if you've heard this number before, but do you know that the body can the liver can make 750 calories a day worth of ketones? Woo! I know 750. That's, yeah, yeah, 750 calories a day. And, and, and if you're keto adapted, most of those calories feed the brain. They run the brain. Mm -hmm. So the brain has a daily caloric requirement of, I forget, 500, 600, uh, you know, maybe total in a day. Um, and a couple of, uh, of neuronal cells require a little bit of glucose. The body can make that um, through a de, do, de novo, well, through gluconeogenesis. But also, when you take that triglyceride and you combust it, you know, you combust the three fatty acids, and then the glycerol is there available to be, to be used to create uh, glucose. So you've got all, uh, this beautiful closed system in you that does not require as many external calories coming from the outside to the inside on a regular basis as most people assume. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like there are days I get by on, you know, well, days, there are weeks when I get by on an average of 1,700 calories a day you know, and, and thrive and am doing fine and, and do hard workouts and 
don't feel like I'm sacrificing. I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, I eat as much as I need. And when I'm finished eating what I need and I'm no longer hungry for the next bite, I push it away and I'm good to go. Yeah. I, when I, I guess, indulge myself in not eating that much and having a very small meal, oftentimes I find that I feel much better the next day. Yeah. You know, you wake up feeling nice and fresh. It's the opposite of having a big meal before bed. Right. right? Um, well, as, um, as our buddy Art Devaney used to say, you know, you're, you're, you're most human when you're not eating. Mm-hmm. You know, all the good stuff happens to the body when you're not eating. Eating is sort of this obligatory thing that we must do to put fuel into the system. Um, it's, it's obligatory and, and much the same way that sex feels good. And so we do it and, and, and just as a sort of a after effect, oh, we procreate. So the reason we're able to procreate is because we're, in, we're enticed into having sex because it feels good. If sex didn't feel good, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to procreate. Well, if eating Not worth it. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Uh, if, uh, if, especially in this day and age. Uh, if, <laughs> oh, God. Me too. Uh, but if, uh, if, if eating didn't taste so great and we weren't wired for these sensations, we'd be disinclined to add on this fuel and take it in um, in the amounts that the body uh, wants us to. Now, when we were originally, when we evolved over millions of years, throughout most of humanity, there was not a lot of food. And so we were wired to overeat, as Rob Wolf would say. We're we're wired to, to, to eat this excess amount of food. The good news is we have these systems that take the excess energy, convert it into energy that we carry around with us on our bodies, conveniently located right over the center of gravity so we can walk miles carrying our extra fuel with us for that you know imagine you're you're um i haven't i haven't told this story as an analogy yet but i'll i'll tell it to you right now um i hiked to the top of um, el cap with my son and a friend of ours and my friend is a base jumper and so every oh, once God. a year on his birthday we he hikes to the top of El Cap, and it's like a four hour hike, and uh, and he jumps off the next morning. Oh my god! Uh, so my son and I went with him this one time, and and as we're getting closer to the top, with a, a mile from the top of El Cap, he says, "Well, we're gonna if we're gonna make a campfire and, and and have some food tonight, we have to bring firewood with us." And so for the last mile, each of us dragged two what amounted to two giant log trees with us to take to, so that when we, we camped on this, on this bald granite face, we had enough fuel for uh, a, a campfire. So, so imagine humans, you know, having to, to lug those logs around with them everywhere they went to make fuel for themselves. So the, the beauty of how we're designed is we can take excess calories, overeat, store it as fuel, carry it with us, and then if we go a day or two or three or five without eating, no problem. We got all the systems to take the fuel out of storage on our, on our butts and thighs and hips, combust it in the muscles so that we have the energy to move and do stuff, make ketones so that we can use the brain to, to stay alert and fresh and happy and thriving. And everything worked beautifully that way. The problem is 99% of humans never, they have the, that, they have that ability to, eat, overeat, and, and store the excess as extra fuel as fat on their body, but they, they haven't built the metabolic machinery and, and the enzyme systems to take it out of storage and combust it in times of need. And if they haven't done the work, then if they skip a meal, all hell breaks loose and they get hangry because you got to do the work to cause the body to want to build the energy systems, to want to build the metabolic machinery, to want to create the, the mitochondria in which the fat actually burns to want to improve the efficiency of the mitochondria, um, you know, to get the brain used to burning ketones. And instead of just having the body spill the ketones out in urine and breath and blood because you haven't built that metabolic machinery. So the good news and what Brad and I talk about it throughout all of our books, but most particularly in Keto for Life, is the process by which over three weeks and then ultimately about six weeks, you can convert your body into this fat burning machine that, uh, that disengages you from that treadmill that is uh, driven by hunger, appetite, and cravings, that leash that uh, mealtime has created around your neck, uh, and, and become empowered 
to, to do all the things and to have the energy and freedom. And, and, uh, I, mean, I think when I say freedom from food, it's a big, big issue for a lot of people. I mean, I, I'd say, you know, many of the people that I, that I talk to and I meet in middle America who haven't gone keto, haven't heard of paleo, don't know about primal, um, you know, food, it, it's an obsession. Yeah. One thing that's happened though, since, since I've met you and first found your blog, it's been like a decade now. Yeah. I thought things might be getting better for a minute there. And now I'm not so sure. Where do you stand on that? How are we going to write this ship? Well, uh, we have, um, uh, dark forces against us in the vegan community. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, you know, uh, game changers was a real, uh, kind of a bizarre propaganda piece that turned out to be a, uh, you know, well-financed and, um, you know, a fairly compelling argument if you don't know uh, anything about nutrition. Yep. And so, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who are like, oh, Mark, have you seen Game Changers? Um, what do you think? Isn't it great? And I'm like, no, it's a f- lie. And it's, uh, <laughs> and, it's, and it's one of the things that's wrong with this country right now is that everybody thinks that, going vegan and or eating a largely plant-based diet is not only better for you, it's better for the planet. And both of those statements are, are, are 100% wrong. Um, vegan is not better for you, it's worse for you. And, and you know, a plant-based diet for humanity is horrible for the planet and will, and will hasten our demise. Yeah. You know, we need to be grazing ruminants and creating topsoil so we can grow whatever vegetables people want to eat. Yeah, uh, it's 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 insanity what's going on in the popular press, uh, you know, in the sort of uh, left wing Hollywood elite, you know, buy into anything uh, kind of climate, and it's really really annoying to me. And it's so mm-hmm. so to your point, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. We have a lot of work to do to, to swing this ship around. I thought we were headed in the right direction. And then the, the kind of, uh, whether it was climate change or the vegan thing or whatever, kind of everything kind of came together. Yeah. Uh, and they, and, and, and by the way, are judged as being synonymous, you know, climate change and veganism and you can't have one without the other. And again, that's inaccurate as well. Yeah. And well, I did, I finally caved after being introduced and asked, I was introduced to some of the people who made the movie and just everyone's asking, like they're asking you, have you seen this movie? I finally caved last night and I watched it. I watched it. Last game. night? Last You're a late cover. Okay. Oh yeah. Super late. I, Cause I've seen enough of these as yeah. you have, right? It's like, no, oh, I on. mean, no, that's exactly right. Like enough of these, I would say, you know, I not only don't want to watch cause I know what I, I know it's going to be a waste of my time because I, it's not going to convince me and I'm just going to get pissed off. So anyway, tell me about your experience. Well, it's very convincing if you don't, if, if you're coming into this as a normal person who's not obsessed with health and, and all of this, like we have been for years and, and for your entire career. I mean, watching it, I know how TV and documentaries are made and it still works on me. You know what I mean? It's like, it, there's a magic at work there and they're doing it on purpose and I don't like that, but I have more to say too. <laughs> yeah, it's a story and humans are storytellers. And, you know, I saw, I watched the Oscars the other night and, uh, you know, uh, Joaquin Phoenix and his don't drink milk thing. I mean, you know, oh, I didn't see that. Oh, it was, it was <laughs> what a joke, a, I must say. Oh, it was, it was horrible. But one of the intros to the documentary uh, award and, you know, documentaries are wonderful and they tell the truth and they, something about how documentaries are supposed to be some objective uh, analysis of some issue in the world. And again, it's the exact opposite. Documentaries are the most biased, pointed propaganda. And what a beautiful opportunity for anyone who has a story to tell at any, at any level, in any direction of any political uh, bent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the more, you know, the, the, the better you tell the story and the more you weave in things that, that uh, you know, magic and alchemy and things that people don't understand and can't figure out for themselves, the more they're snowed and baffled and like oh my god that was amazing and um that guy he's so strong he's strong as an ox because he eats like an ox you know well he's dumb as an ox and he's like an <laughs> ox too so i mean pick you know pick one 
But I don't mean to, I mean, he, he, I'm sure he's a sweet guy, but, but you can't just say I'm strong as an ox because I eat like an ox. You have five stomachs. And you, but documentaries are true. <laughs> well, exactly. They're, they're, and I, I, but, but people you know, assume because it's a documentary that was produced by a responsible, upstanding documentarian, yeah. you know, it, must, it must be giving a point of view that's more accurate than the opposite side of that story. One thing that I found really objectionable, though, was how much fake meat you wouldn't believe. How much yeah. they were eating chicken tenders. They were eating, um, I think they had like fake and bacon. They had, there's like, oh, these burgers are so good. And these chicken tenders are so good. It's like, and you're saving the world in virtue signaling that you're like, what is this even about? It, it's falling apart in my mind. But most people who are watching won't watch it that way, unfortunately. Right. No, it, it, it blows my mind that people who say we should be eating more vegetables and not eating animals are then trying to take their vegetable matter and create an animal. And make it bleed. Oh, They're making and make it, it bleed. And make it bleed. And make it bleed. I don't, if, if you know, a listener who's not simpatico with, with what you and I believe is hearing this, I, I just, I want to challenge you to think about that. And think about how bizarre it is to, to make fake meat, to take, uh, you know, kibble and frankenfood and shape it into something that resembles meat because you want somebody to be healthy uh, and, and not and to eat save meat. the world. And save the world, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so the saving the world part, if I may too, it's just like, and I did think this way and I tried being vegan and vegetarian back in the day and I did think Dude, I was, I was helping things. We all did. We all, well, I didn't think I was helping things. I thought I was helping myself. But, well, sure. But I, don't, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that there's one of us in this paleo keto, low carb community that didn't try vegan yeah. at some point. Yeah. And you know, and failed miserably, but you were doing it wrong. Abel. Right. I was, I mean, I was, if you're going to do yeah. vegan, you have to have it dialed in, yeah. you know, even best case scenario. But, but anyway, before we get too carried away on that, I want to make sure um, the sun on the slope story, when you talk about, you know, aging gracefully and what that's supposed to look like uh, yeah. when you were trying to, uh, well, I don't want to tell the story for you, but it really touched me. I, I would, if you would uh, share that with us. Uh, remind me. So when you were, Going down the double black diamond, I think it was with your oh, son. My, I thought, oh, I see. I thought you meant <laughs> the sun on the slopes, like oh. <laughs> like the, the, the orb in the sky. And I'm like, okay, that might be a better um, story. No, no, mystical. no. I just uh, no. It's no. Um, so Kyle, uh, my son, he was ten when he started snowboarding. He wanted to snowboard, and I'd been a skier all my life. So um, he and I learned together and I learned uh, pretty quickly and, and I taught him a bunch of stuff about how to turn and um, uh, do you snowboard at all? Ski. Okay. So in snowboarders, you watch them turn. There's a bit of a, a, a you know, a, 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 a action like this to get mm -hmm. the, the tip around. And so uh, do you remember Chris Farley on Saturday night live <laughs> when he used to do the, uh, uh, the motivational speaker, <laughs> the, the motivational speaker. Oops. And uh, so, uh, who lived in a van down by the river, right. by the way. Um, so I would teach my kids to turn that way as because they were fans <laughs> so of Chris Carly. Right. So I would teach, that's how I taught them how to turn. Anyway, so over the years, we, you know, as a family, and my wife snowboards too, as a family, we'd go and we'd snowboard and we'd have a great time. And, and, you know, Kyle got better and better. And I actually got better and better. And there was a time one day when he was 14 and we're at the top of this uh, double black, uh, and it was on uh, uh, Highlands in Aspen, and uh, and we're gonna we're going down the hill, and I'm and I'm like in front of him, and I'm hauling ass, and I'm just going really really fast, and I'm thinking I'm going a little bit too fast, man. I gotta I should probably scrub off some speed. This is this is as fast as I dare go, and all of a sudden my out of the corner of my eye, my son passes me going probably 12 miles an hour faster than I was. And cut, you know, cut across my the front with plenty of room to spare. And looked up at me and gave me a thumbs up. And I'm like, okay, that's <laughs> the, the torch is passed. My son has now overtaken me forever. And uh, it's, it, but you know, as a parent, it's like your your proudest moment. And as a as a human being, it's like, oh Jesus, there goes that. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I'm not the top dog in that <laughs> regard anymore. But it was it was a beautiful moment and. 
Um, and he and I, you know, we played Frisbee together and I still, he's a, he, he became one of the best Frisbee, Frisbee players, ultimate players in, in, um, in Southern California. And um, he and I, we still are on the same team. Every time we do uh, pick up games, we make sure we're on the same team and try to hit each other with long bombs. And it's, it's great. Yeah. That is so cool. And that, what a great example of, uh, I think how it's supposed to work, right? Because as, as we just to come back to you're defying the norms uh, and, and most people can't get out of their cars yeah, you know, know. in their sixties and seventies yeah. and, and you're hanging and playing, you know, a, pretty much elite level Frisbee from what I understand. Yeah. I wouldn't call elite level anymore, but, um, but it's, it's uh, I, I still play well and I still play a, a sort of a old man's def, uh, game. I can, I mean, I can sprint, I can run, I do all stuff. But um, I'm like the guy who hangs out in midfield, and I'm, I'll take a I'll take a handoff from the the, the handler so that he can just re, I'll just give it, give it right back to him so he can reset. I don't know if you know the game at all, but a little bit. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a utilitarian player, right? I'm not yeah. I'm not a superstar. I'm just a utilitarian player, but I have a blast doing it. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you hold your weight. <laughs> well, Mark, we're just about out of time, but before we go, please tell folks about your new book, Keto for Life, as well as all the other stuff that you're working on. Yeah, so Keto for Life, uh, again, it takes a look, a uh, holistic approach at using a ketogenic sort of um, template, uh, but it doesn't require that you be keto. It just spend a little bit of time in and out of keto. Uh, but lots of things we, we delve into sleep and sun exposure and other elements of, uh, of uh, mobility, because that's one of the things that defines longevity is your, your ability to move through space. Um, and uh, it's we talk about pivoting and, and flexibility, mental flexibility, and being able to withstand uh, the rigors of and the assaults of uh, social media, and uh, you know your whatever situation you're in, how to how to how to come out of that, uh, you know, feeling with a, with a sense of well-being as opposed to feeling like you're beat up. So the book is called Keto for Life. You can get it wherever great books are sold, and obviously on Amazon. Uh, Mark's Daily Apple is the blog. Uh, we are now into the 14th year uh, of blogging at Mark's Daily Apple. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. 14. And, um, and then Primal Kitchen Foods. Um, you know, we have all these amazing um, salad dressings and barbecue sauces and condiments and, and rust Facts. mustard and, and ketchup. And they're all good for you. I mean, literally, the more you put on your food, the better the food becomes for you, I think. We're introducing frozen foods in the next, uh, in the next quarter. Wow. That's amazing meals that you can buy in the frozen sh- section, you know, grass fed beef, uh, range chicken, free range chicken, uh, organic vegetables and things like that that are just easy to prepare. So very excited about that. And yeah, and I, that's all. Mark, thank you so much for putting in the work over the years and being so generous with your knowledge. And uh, you've, you've really helped me navigate dangerous waters over the years on many times. And I'm so thankful for that. And yeah. I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure I'd be doing this show without finding you way back in the day to help me revamp my, I, I think I found barefoot running and really got into it yeah, back in Mark's really. Daily Apple. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what a value. You and I, we, no, thank you. you. You and I can both say we, we go back a long way together. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I love that. Very cool. And we need each other. Thank you so much for this, Mark. Thanks, man. Take care. This episode is brought to you by listeners like you and Future Greens. You may know that I'm not a big fan of most supplements. It's hard to know if you're getting what you paid for. And even worse, many supplements, juices, powders, and greens we've tried taste terrible. For example, have you ever noticed that most powdered vegetable mixes taste like fish tank? Don't even mention fish oil supplements. Once you've had fish burps, it's hard to trust that brand again. So that's why Allison and I have spent the last three plus years creating wild superfoods. And it's our goal to give you the very best nutrition the world has to offer. Now you can get the concentrated nutrition of 15 organic fruits and vegetables plus six other superfoods in one extremely convenient ready-to-go package. We call it Future Greens. And if you're looking to improve your health, performance, and well-being by doubling your intake of fruits and veggies without the sugar and carbs, you're going to love it. With Future Greens, you can whip up your daily green drink in less than 30 seconds, no matter where you are. The certified organic stevia gives it a subtle sweetness and it tastes great in water or juice, and we think it even makes our green smoothies taste a whole lot better. 
It's made with certified organic, non-GMO fruits and vegetables to aid in detoxification, balance your body's pH, and give you a boost of clean energy without sugar, caffeine, or the dreaded crash. No junk or artificial sweeteners, and just one gram of sugar per serving. With the tasty wild berry flavor, you and your kids won't even realize you're eating broccoli and 20 plus powerhouse fruits, veggies, and adaptogens. So if you want to try our brand new creation from Wild Superfoods called Future Greens, we have even better news for you. As a listener of Fat Burning Man, and it's proof that you are because you're listening right now, you can actually get a 20% discount to try Future Greens yourself. Just visit fatburningman.com forward slash greens to get 20% off when you select subscribe and save. Once again, just visit fatburningman.com slash greens to check out Future Greens and get your special listener deal. We'll see you there. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for the Fat Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or a family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far, We've won four awards, hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and, and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors, and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. We'll give you a, a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now, along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again and have a great week.